Camille Heskey's autobiography may be called Even Heskey Scored. In fact, stop, strike that. It is called Even Heskey Scored. It's a sardonic title aimed at taking the piss out of those who take the piss out of him for his scoring record as a professional footballer, which was brilliant, and the fact that somebody once described the 5-1 when England scored or Germany in Munich with the even Heskey scored. This is the story of a man who's now got alternative titles for his book. The big interview drew out of him, Can They Cope With Me? Just Give Me The Ball? Emil's intelligent, articulate, interesting, and he'll tell you whether Martin O'Neill ever made him cry. He'll tell you the tricks players invoked in order not to have the stinking, swear word covered yellow jersey in training. He'll talk about finals of the League Cup in four different stadia. Trivia fans, get ready. This is a bright, confident footballer who's had to deal with terrible racist abuse throughout his life, but has excellent, forthright, modern solutions to the problem. This is the big interview with Emil Heskey. Jointly, we score big time. The life I lead is very privileged to all listeners. Out the window right now, I can see um, rhododendrons, a beautiful rolling garden coming down to... It's not Babylon where it's all to the edge. And by his own admission, we're with, well, we're with somebody who described himself as a strange person. No, he's not. That's not what he's famous <laughs> for. We're with the brilliant, the very interesting Emil Heskey. And as I say to all my guests, thank you for being generous, generous enough to take time in your schedule no and talk to a weirdo no. like me on the big interview. Thank no you very problem, much. No. The reason I know, because I didn't know until very recently, that you describe yourself as a strange person, you say, I really am, mm-hmm. and you say it for a particular reason, because although you were successful, characterful, resourceful, intelligent in your chosen career, mm-hmm. Emil, you said that you, you talk about having to overcome mm-hmm. a sort of a shyness, mm-hmm. a reserve, which you would admit bears no relation to the guy we saw no. on the pitch, on the television. But for those who are about to hear about the brilliance of your sporting life, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that side of you and why you start a chapter in your book saying, <laughs> I'm the strange person I really am. No, because when people come up to you in the street, they'll, they'll remember you for what they see you as on the television, on the thing. When people come up to me for the first time, especially when I was younger, it was like, who's this? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, I, I'm not used to people coming up to you and grabbing you unless they're your family or someone like that. So, and I, even then, it's you, you, people. You've, <laughs> you've, you've done a double take there as if to say, yeah. whoa, what's going on? Yeah. I, I sort of... Because I was just shy, I was I, I, I was good I, I, around. Unsure about how to cope with yeah. that kind of interaction. Yeah, but football pitch is kind of a release from that. So it was just go oh, okay, go and express yourself. I'm good at that, so let me go and express myself. I was actually preferred running, preferred sprinting, up and down the schoolyard, just sprinting, picking on people to beat. Right, to beat to, I'll yeah. race you, I'll race you, I'll race I was you. Good. No one would beat me, so <laughs> that that was that. And then took it onto football, where introduce a ball. OK, I'm OK with that now. Let's go and try that. Really, really good. Got spotted. The rest is history. But going back to the other bit is I wasn't necessarily comfortable being around people, um, apart from my family and friends. Very shy. Underneath my mum all the time. So, yeah, it was... And people people might find that weird, but it's just different kids. I've got I've got kids now, and one is just... Outgoing, you've got to keep an eye, eye on her 24 7. She'll just walk off. Um, we were, we was recently in Italy and she did it. And we're like looking, thinking, where she And she just strolls back like nothing's happened. Happy and I, confident I, and relaxed. Yeah, nothing. I, I would never do that. No. And, and as you describe it, you come from a very character, characterful family. Mm-hmm. And let's say, although it might be false, I think it's often expected that you were one of a few sons, but a son's like the dad, and your dad was confident, outgoing, couldn't quite understand it. But it, uh, rather than a fearfulness, it, you also speak about you, you just having always been 
pretty happy in your own skin, yeah, pretty yeah, happy yeah. in your own character, in your yeah. own company. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was Which is a nice thing to be blessed with. Very, very happy. Um, again, people might find that strange. People might find it weird that you can just go and just sit there and sit there comfortably on your own and do something on your own, where other people like need people around them yeah. to, to have a discussion. And it's a can, much worse curse not to be happy in your own head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because That's you, a really you, tough you, thing. Because as well, you're constantly um, relying on other people um, where I didn't necessarily need that. I could... Even with talent and athleticism, mm -hmm. football world is, is weird. It's outright idiosyncratic, eccentric. It, as much as it's full of wonderful people, it's full of idiots too. Mm -hmm. If you've got this instinctive reserve or shyness, you call it. Did, was that a, did that become a barrier in any way? <clears throat> Probably off the pitch, yeah, but not on it, because I I I I knew uh, how to um, just just part everything and that was the easy part. The football pitch, <laughs> <laughs> the football pitch was the easy part. The football pitch was no problem at all. Um, that was probably a release from a lot of things, but the actual. Living a daily life and times as well was something that you you you're never taught. You never yeah. know. You kind of thrown in the deep end. I was sixteen doing interviews, seventeen doing big interviews, eighteen on national TV. N liking it or not liking it? Not particularly because it was out of my depth. Got used to it because you as well. You you learn as well along, along the way. It's like a job, isn't it? You learn on on the job, and so you're learning how to deal with certain things. Um, now they have media training. Yeah, yep. media training. So it was you learn on the job, don't you? So it was tough at times, but again, you uh, I, I learnt along the way. And if you're shy, Arthur, because it's not a chronic thing, mm -hmm. but it, but I, I am interested in the contrast that mm -hmm. you've even said it more clearly that. The football side was easy, which for the rest of us we're pretty jealous of. <laughs> but if you're in a, addressing them at any stage in your life, and this shyness dissipates, full of really strong or noisy, vibrant or provocative characters, and you're tending to be quiet, and everybody knows you do your talking on the pitch, and everybody respects mm -hmm. you because you've got ability, but in addressing them, to be a bit sh quiet, not like now, let's say, mm -hmm. can also be a drawback, because it can, it can draw the idiots to you, or you can... I was lucky. Because I had talent. Yeah. Because they left me alone, kind of sense. But I could see, I, I know where you're going with this, where you could be picked on for just being that quiet guy in the it corner. It can be so, can't Yeah, it? but I was lucky because I had talent and I was pr producing. Um, it was all right then. Yeah, Mill's there. That's fine. Um, he'll, sit, he'll sit around us, but he won't really interact and stuff like that. And uh, they'll pro we'll probably even touch on other things later where things that happened abroad with, with Leicester and stuff like that. I wasn't, a, I wasn't even around. Mm -hmm. I was in my room mm -hmm. <laughs> when people are going crazy doing all sorts of things and and, and then I hear about it later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was around people, but I didn't really get involved in a lot of the... It's interesting that they afforded you that respect because even the best people in, in sport, the ones who don't want to join in, they, they, even without attracting bullying, it can be regarded as... If that person doesn't want to join in with our pranks or, mm -hmm. or whatever, or a banter, or whatever it is, that makes them different and maybe we feel a bit challenged by that. Or that it's, it's not always that people accept mm -hmm. the individual. That... I was young as well. I was only 60, uh, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. So it was, and so we, at Leicester we had, uh, you have your first team change rooms and you have the youth team change mm -hmm. rooms, youth and uh, reserves, younger pros. I was sitting with these, but playing with these. So I was a character in this one, which I was around my own surroundings and around my own age group. Yeah. But then I was playing with these, and I would just sit in the corner and be quiet and maybe chime in there every now and again, but nothing major. What the, what the hell kind of good piece of luck was it that you were born in and around Leicester? Because you've lived through an era where Leicester's been the centre of English sporting excellence. <laughs> Well, for uh, for um, for rugby. I mean, at that stage, they were, they were maybe they were the best club side in the world. Uh -huh. In in UK terms, they were practically unbeatable. They were uh -huh. ferocious, uh -huh. brilliant to watch, brilliantly uh -huh. supported. They, uh -huh. they were extraordinary. You you were aware of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you got, you're living in Leicester. You can't not be aware of them. Yeah. <laughs> they the biggest. They were basically man new at the time. Yeah, yeah, they were of uh, of rugby and. Uh, they made it. They made the football aware that that we were smaller than them. Oh yeah, 
yeah, everything was rugby in, in Leicester. Most, majority, so even when I went to school, it was, or well, when I went to secondary school, it was rugby that we played first. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, we you to have these big fields and then you go and play football on your own kind of thing. Were you good? At rugby? Yeah. Didn't like it. Because? I tried, I, had a, I had a go and I was okay because I was quick and I could move yeah. with the ball and I could move. But Winger, full back? I I, just give me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know, listen, if it's not published, that might be a new sort of subtitle to the front page of the Arbor. <laughs> just give me the ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Love it. But I, I, I didn't... Yeah, I mean, if the enjoyment's not there, yeah, it probably it. doesn't matter yeah. about how naturally athletic or talented yeah. you are. And, and, you know, ball to hand is very different than ball to feet. feet. It's exactly. a completely different feeling. Yeah. I, I had a go at tennis... Not really great at that. Badminton, I quite liked. Uh-huh. Um, so I'd got every sport. Cricket. Your dad. Your da- dad was a cricketer, yeah. uh, and it, because coming from the Caribbean, that is the number one sport. So you have to sit there, you have to watch, you go for. If we're talking about Leicester and Martin Johnson, yeah. If you go back to when I'm older than you, but you go back to that, you know, fire in the hole, that Roberts and Marshall yeah. and. You know, whispering death and holding and Greenwich and Haynes so, and uh, Andy Roberts. I've got a picture with Andy Roberts as a as a baby, and he's, I'm on his knee. If anybody doesn't know, one of the world's great fast bowlers. Yeah. Back then, we had like a uh, there was a lot of Antigans in in Leicester, so there was a big community, and you play cricket every weekend down at a, a place called Crown Hills. It's a school down in in predominantly black area, black and Asian area. Play cricket there every weekend, and majority of the time we were just playing, messing about with the other kids, and playing, but playing football. When everyone else was playing cricket, it wasn't a sport I was okay at, it, but uh, it wasn't a sport that I particularly wanted to take up. To be honest, it wasn't a sport that I say, yeah, let's go and play some cricket. No, I'd rather go and let's go and play some football. Was your dad good? Yeah, it was okay. I'm guessing. Okay, I hope he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> Tyrone, I, I heard you were brilliant, actually. <laughs> and, you were, and you got bored as well of that sport. It's, it just interests me because, it, 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 you know, Leicester, I'm sure Leicester had Gower, and there was a stage when Leicester were also a good county side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the Midlands is... OK, Edgebaston's not nice, to, but the Midlands is a, is a powerful place for cricket. I, yeah. I love my cricket. We happen to be in the middle of an Ashes series. But just now, like rugby, it never got its hooks into you as no, a sport no, at all. No, 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 not at all, not at all. But yeah, we used to go every, every, especially summer, obviously summertime, play every weekend, Sunday, either go down to London, down here, play local side. Yeah. You mentioned Antigua, but to, to what extent has your Caribbean ancestry, the, the music, the food, the, your visits there, as you look, now, as a fully formed adult, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. successful career behind you, <coughs> what extent has that culture, those ideas, those people, shaped your success? Not just the guy you are now. What what influence has it had on the, the choices and the successes? Every everything. Um, well, I speak about it in the book as well. Um, everything I did, everything we did was British Caribbean. So Sunday, you'd think you'd go for a regular Sunday roast, but we had Sunday dinner at home, uh, a Caribbean, some typical Caribbean Sunday. For example, it, it could it could vary. You'd have you'd have chicken, you'd have rice, you'd have your, your vegetables, you'd have dumplings, you'd have plantain, you'd have you'd have all sorts. That was a typical thing every Sunday, and we'd go to church first, back, then eat, then you might be able to go and play out. Mm. Everything around that was. My, my upbringing, everything was uh, the, the the Caribbean, typical Caribbean upbringing, and you touch on racism. Uh, we touch on racism in the book as well. Yeah, and you deal with it in a certain way. We knew that it was there. You don't. When it's a system, it's hard to fight it. But what can you do? You just get on with it. You know that you have to work harder in certain aspects, whether it be in your job, whether it be in your school, or whatever it is. You know that you have to work hard. On the street harder. sometimes too. Everywhere. Choices. Everything. Where to walk. When to walk. <laughs> it's, uh, it's brutal that we have to even speak about that. Did you speak about it then? Was it, was it, was it something that families it. had to share and talk about? You, you, you kind of instinctively know your family, will, you're guided by them as well. Hmm. So um, instinct, they didn't necessarily need to say. Some did. You'll always have, you'll always have classism, you'll always have uh, sexism. Well, when I say always, but it will be there. 
and it will be it it will, it will be tiered, and people will try and implement that to better themselves. Uh, I'll give you an example. We was away recently in, play, uh, in 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 Italy. My daughter was just dancing there, and another girl, a white girl, came uh, came across pretty much the same age, I'm guessing, and they just started dancing together, holding each other's hands. It was fine. There's no kids problem. Don't, yeah, they, they don't, don't have this. They don't, don't think it's you, like. But again, you don't know what years later, after being in the system, what that child's going to be thinking uh, when they get older. Because it's, it's in the system that you okay, no, uh, there's tears. Oh no, he's they're down there. We can't talk to them. We can't we can't socialize with them. And mm. You don't know until you actually sat down and spoke to them. You, the things you might have in common, mm. you might gain a, a, another friend. You don't know, but you you because you've got tears and then you've got classism and then you've got racism. It's all, it's all no one actually gets to know anyone until you encourage those who are letting it happen. They aren't active participants in some form of racism, but they're allowing it to go unless you say to them we're going to give you an incentive by punishing you that you will eradicate it, then it'll just drift. Again, it's not new to say punish. punish yeah. You talk about education as well. You, mm-hmm. you actually talk... And, and you talk about... A, a, now we're back to football, even though it's a societal yeah, problem. Yeah. You talk about a panel of people who can talk about this, who can, rather than you know, a crowd of FA blazers who are all, or predominantly white, who are all 50 and above and don't know about the problem. You'd like to see what exactly happening? Well, even the panel. You've got to have, you've got to have people who understand it, who have suffered. suffered. Yeah, who have suffered from it. Um, if you haven't suffered from something, how can you actually really understand what's going on? I spoke about before with other people that um, I've been in airports where I've, I've sat down at the, the coffee shop. The only place to sit was the little... Bar, the little bar stool mm-hmm. that looks into the airport. So I, yeah. put, I sat down there, I put my bag here, there was a table behind me. They all got up and walked off, walked to the other side. Of the, well, first the, the woman grabbed her bag yeah. and held it first and then moved to the other side of the uh, coffee shop. I knew what was going on, but to use, it might not look like anything, but I know what's going on. Because Don't you we? suffered that, Don't because we? people will perceive X just because of your skin colour. Yeah. Like, so in the book which we'll talk about and we'll name, and which is very good. It's interesting, it's funny. It, it also brings you into dressing rooms really well. I yep, yep. to do that as well. <laughs> but you talk about ridiculous things about, like, if you live in a nice area and you happen to be black or Asian, mm-hmm. you must be a sportsman. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's no other way, no other way yeah, yeah. that you could... Or maybe younger, you were approached and asked to if you had drugs simply because oh, yeah, yeah. a black man in a, in, a, in a nightclub. That still, still happens now. So the, the, the coffee shop... It's just another example yeah. of oh, we've been indoctrinated or we're stupid enough to go like, <laughs> that, that think, person's think, skin means yeah. my suitcase is under threat. There's no statistics that show that either. So I don't know where it's all come from. I don't know if it's just a scaremonger or just something that's uh, happened over years that people just feel that whenever they're around people of colour, mm-hmm. they have to be on their toes a little bit. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, no, I no I'm, you know, I'm not asking you to be the, the world's leading sociologist. <laughs> Unless people like me, mm-hmm. who haven't had to suffer this, learn and talk about it and ask the people who might come up with solutions, then we're not going to do anything about it. No. Something seems to me to be sensible about the Rooney Rule, broadly. It seems, to, from my point of view, that if people in sport will come to offices... In sport, football, might be unaware that instinctively or subliminally, subconsciously, they're not giving people of colour mm-hmm. an opportunity, then it might not be active racism that's presenting black men and women progressing in sport mm-hmm. administratively or coaching or director or owner is a different thing because yeah, money, money talks. Yeah. If you give a person of any creed or colour the chance to sit across a desk... That You're in the problem. game. That, that, You're in yeah. the game yeah. about the person who's making the decision going, that person's perfect, fabulous, mm-hmm. or has got a chance. Mm-hmm. So the Rooney Rule I th- is I, a step forward? I think it's definitely a step forward because it's not saying you must. No. It's just saying be open to the opportunity, to the, to the thought of having yeah. someone in there. Um, I, th- th- there's, there's players that have been that have sent uh, applications out for jobs and not had uh, one player said 15. I had one back. And I get it, you've got loads of people applying, but 
to have 15 and not have one back. Well, and it seems a, it seems a common thing within the, the we'll say, BAME uh, applicants. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's something that I think is possibly important because you're talking, it, it, it was brought out in America, right? Yes. So you're talking about a country that I would probably perceive as worse than here when it comes to that. It certainly seems so at the moment. But better when it comes to employment, Mm -hmm. when it comes to black employment, because they don't, as long as you can do the job, they don't care. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at that sort of things, you know. Uh, We we have big companies on in 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 uh, the UK uh, with you know big sports companies who have the television rights and stuff like that, and they have the same over there. But you could go over there and see a full crew of African Americans where you would never ever see that here. So the, the, explain for those who don't know the importance of 17-year-old M.L. Heskey or your or, or Jaden or mm-hmm. whoever it might be, mm-hmm. a, a form of age going, there's a person like me oh, on the television or on the radio or leading. Or, aspire. You aspire to... I, I, I grew up watching, uh, you, you know, the, the likes of John Barnes, Viv Anderson, a good friend. You know, uh, Ian Wright was a special one for me. Obviously, they don't do it now. We used to have jobs for YTS. Me and my best friend, Owen Johnson, is someplace for um, less than now. We, we, we were on something else. I can't even remember what we were on. But we, uh, Newcastle were playing... Andy Cole was at Newcastle. Newcastle were playing against uh, Leicester. At Fulwish, he scored as well. He uh, he scored that day, and we were doing. I can't remember. We might have been in the home dressing room. We kicked them out, of the, kicked the people out of the uh, of, of the uh, away dressing room, told them they got to swap with us just so we can go and see Andy Cole. Brilliant. Yeah, and sat down with him, sweeping up, but looking at looking at him and that you know, them sort of things that were aspiring to be. And that, and the thing is as well, when you look at um, television. Mm-hmm. It's only, for us, it was only sports that you could look at and say, yeah, athletics. You know, the only sport you could see, 100 metres uh, final with eight black people running. Uh, so you're saying, OK, well, I want to be, I want to do that. I look at that, look at him, I aspire to be him. Arsenal, in the 90s, right? When you had Paul six Davis. or seven black mm-hmm. players playing for them. Mm-hmm. You're like, wow, look at them. So he's the first black football you remember watching? No, no. It would have probably been, it would have probably been John Barnes John. Uh, um, as well. You, you didn't have much football on television either, so <laughs> you got to remember True. that. But you're going off little little snippets you see every, everywhere and, and and hearing the name. And my 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 uncle was a big Liverpool fan, so you hear the name John Barnes and stuff like that. So yeah, um, they're the ones you you aspire to be. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna, you're pretending to run around. I'm right footed, but pretending to run around like I'm left footed because of. John Barnes, but it helped anyway because you can get to use your left foot a little bit more. But little things like that. But now there's no real one that you can say. And there was no, no one back then you could say, I aspire to be. Trevor McDonald was the only one really, weren't there? And he doing, doing certain things. To, to my memory, yeah. I suppose it makes um, what Garth Crooks. Garth Crooks, yeah. It makes what Garth achieved stand out a huge, little bit. Huge, huge. And he's the only one. And again, you look at that, is that just, you know, is that just ticking, ticking box? Oh, we've done that one now, so. You, you talked about the area you grew up in, and one of the things that I'd like to believe unites us is that I'm mad passionate about the club I support, Aberdeen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I trundle on about them all the time in this series. Apart from Leicester being a place where you won trophies and won fame and presumably had an enjoyable career, I feel that you're left with a love for the club. I mean, not this instant, but broadly, you're a footballer who supports the club, or have I got that wrong? <clears throat> I was a Liverpool supporter, but when you go from the age of nine all the way up till 22, it's, it's a club that is in your heart. Um, they gave me the opportunity. If that, like I say before, even when I did uh, did what I did with the donation, um, with, Th- we, this is when the club was genuinely yeah. in jeopardy, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, not I'm, everyone I'm, will know this. <clears throat> administration. So um, Gary Lineker was heading the consortium. Um, so I just felt that it was right for me to get involved as well because I'm from there. That's 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 me. Uh, everyone asks, oh yeah, yeah, I'm from Liverpool. Oh, I'm from Leicester. <laughs> everyone knows I'm from Leicester, and and that's where my heart is as a city. Mm-hmm. You know, so to have the club, the club that helped me get to where I was, is is it going the way that it was going. It just wasn't didn't feel right. Didn't sit right. So it was a case of what could I do? How can I help? And that was the that was the way to 
to to get on get involved with with that uh, consortium and it was something that I would do again and again. I really respect that because in life, just in general, if you see something that you want or you don't like, you act. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does, no. but you should. So let's take this because we're talking about Leicester now. Mm -hmm. You scored a lot at Leicester. You were a very successful footballer, very good footballer. What's the title of your autobiography, Emil? Even Heskey scored. Why? That was the tongue in cheek with uh, with the five one. <laughs> For England and Germany yeah. and. Who, did, I mean, who said it? A commentator or? Oh, it's 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 now an urban myth. Yeah, yeah. It, it was said. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so you you've used that cheekily. Yeah. Uh, because you're taking the piss out of somebody being as dopey as to say and even. Yeah, it's, look. It's the, the thing is, you, you you've you've got the stats there, so you can actually see. Well, you can see how, how that I scored and and, uh, well, and how, what I what I achieved, but. If you take if you if you go by what people say, it's like you've never you've never played football before. Leicester City, nineteen ninety four to two thousand, one hundred and eighty four appearances, forty six goals. Liverpool, two thousand to two thousand four, one hundred and seventy six appearances for Liverpool, forty seven. Uh, pardon me, sixty goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think I counted before you sat down in the region of nine trophies. I got, do you know what? Shearer got one. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not putting Alan Shearer down. No, we got the Premier League, though. Nobody was saying, and, and, and even Shearer scored. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you nicked all these goals, trophies, success everywhere, respected and craved by managers and fellow pros, mm -hmm. but there's this thing hanging over you, and you've been cheeky and named about that, mm -hmm. or cheeky to your detractors. Yeah. Yeah, look, you've got to, at times, you've just got to take it, take the, the, the rough with the smooth, smooth and, and have, a little, have a little joke with it. Bumped into a guy in the airport once, started talking to me about football, blah, blah, blah. He goes, yeah, but you didn't score many goals. I goes, well, I scored over 100 in the Premier League. He went, did you? <laughs> oh, I don't like football, I like rugby anyway. I was like, what are you talking <laughs> Why about? are you standing here talking shit to me? <laughs> so, but that's... Perception. Perception, again. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is becoming a theme about perception. <laughs> Give us the privilege, because apart from earning well, becoming famous, mm -hmm. and whatever else football brings you, you've got the great privilege of having been inside the world that everybody listening to the series craves. Mm -hmm. We're all a little bit envious. That's so take us inside the, the training ground atmosphere. You've made it, you're there. I want to know... The training about... ground atmosphere is the best. That is where, even when people retire, that's the only bit they kind of, they miss. Being around lads that are your, that are your, more or less your own age, mm -hmm. and the banter that you get, the laughs that you get, it's just, it just feels fun all the time. Even pre-season, you're, you're half-time, you're dying from doing the running, but you're still laughing, you're still joking. There's banter that you get that you, get, that you cannot take anywhere else, because you just won't understand it, you no. know, might find it a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> For example... If you want a clue, I'll give you a clue. Go on. Yellow jersey. Stinky yellow oh, jersey. But that's Explain fun. Explain that. Is so it... the yellow jersey is basically the worst player of the... I wouldn't say of the week. It was of that day. So we'd play it on Friday before the Saturday games. But it's, it's, it got too fierce in the end because no one wanted to win the yellow jersey because it's basically you nominate the worst player for that day. So you want to win the game first and then the winners nominate. And then even the losers get to nominate as well. So you're like, you rubbish. But you do it, uh, <laughs> ever. but it's, it's good fun. And then your name gets written on it. It doesn't get washed. Ever? No. So it stinks? Yeah. You really don't want that yellow no, jersey? No, 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 no. I don't think I got that, to be honest. I don't. We'll be contacting your fellow players. Yeah, that, that, you, you know we will check this story. We're big it, fat the, checkers thing is, The thing is, it was, probably it was say, always, he did just it was always between <laughs> Steve Guppy. Name him. And Steve, Stevie Claridge. Marshall? Marshall as well. Maybe. But Marshall was great at deflecting. So Ian Marshall would, as soon as he comes on the training field, he'd be planting little seeds in people's heads. Oh, he's having a bad day, isn't he? <laughs> he's having a bad day. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so you've immediately onto him. Who he's playing with the mind. <laughs> but it was great. It was great fun. It was great fun. We used to play young v old. Mm -hmm. That was tough as well because you'd play with Steve, Steve Walsh up front, Matty Elliott up front. And Ian Marshall up front. They, all they do is just throw it into the box. Yeah. And who's going to win? <laughs> You're probably going to win most of the aerial challenges, I would have thought, aye. And you would maybe get the odd elbow. Yeah. We, we've, in this series again, we, we had a, an, a big interview with Suey and one with Terry Butcher. We asked, asked them about playing 
was it England v Scotland mm -hmm. on the red ash. And I don't know if you've seen red ash, but it's like gravel pitch outside Ibrox on a Friday before a Saturday game, the day before a big game, England v Scotland, and it was just all in. Yeah, and that was it because no one wanted to lose. It was it was pretty stupid to be honest with you because <laughs> no because you 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 you'd, you'd want to really you'd be winding down towards the end of the week because you want to get ready for the game, but this was the this was the game everyone was look, was looking forward to. So you'd be literally. No, you don't want to lose that game. One, you don't want to get yellow jersey. And two, you don't want them bragging all the week. No, you, so you want you focus on that one day, Friday. Take us through the characters, because when I started talking about when we, when we went down Leicester Tigers, and then, you, you know, you've, you've lived through two gigantic eras of Leicester success, one in which you played, latterly post-career, looking at something that people would classify as one of the great football stories. Your era. Pick the ones you want, not maybe the ones I suggest. But I would contend that, like, I used to love watching Marshall when he went up front mm -hmm. or socks rolled down, looking like Stig of the Dump. <laughs> he was. But an, the, another phenomenon of our big interview will be, we were recently with Matt Janssen, mm -hmm. who had tough, tough luck about what was a promising career being broken by a motorbike accident. But he would talk about Mark Hughes coming to training, having left Everton. And he's, you know, he actually goes into detail about how Mark Hughes was... Shit in training. Absolute rubbish. Mm -hmm. Saturday, yeah, bang on. We had players like that. So, uh, so. Uh, Stevie Claridge. Stevie Claridge, uh, you, uh, you, if you watched him on the football pitch Monday, Monday to Friday, I would say, you'd think that he never played before. Stevie Claridge used to rock up. We used to come in at 10.30, just be, just be ready for 10.30 on the pitch. That's what we used to be. Um, the manager changed that to 10.15 in to be on the pitch on the 10.30. Ready at 10.30? Yeah, because Steve Claridge used to rock up, pull his car right up next to the football pitch at nine at uh, 10.28, jump out with his boots and his full, fully kitted, jump on the pitch and uh, go and train. And then after that, jump in his car and then he's off. That was, what, that was his routine every day. And then the manager changes that you have to be in there 15 minutes, sometimes half an hour before the training session. Even then, that's not a revolutionary change. No, no. You get him rocking up in a car, jumping out and then back in again. Right, well, we're going to introduce the 15 minute rule. That's yeah. not exactly and then, like, he, sports he, science. He, he would, um, the thing with uh, Steve Clowes, the actual football part of things, you think, oh, he's never played before. He's, he come, the ball come to me. He just, he just loved having a joke. Nothing, nothing was serious with him. He'd be pissing about all the time. But, uh, when the ball comes to him, he'd be jumping out the way like he didn't want to touch it. You're like, what's wrong with him? And then he'd, the running he was great at, he'd, he'd be first around there and he'd be, he'd be winning everything. And then come the Saturday game, amazing. But that, OK, but that jump is hard for people to understand because mm. most of us who wish we had your talent, his talent, you're like, well, pff, yeah, OK, you might break rules about going out at night, you might do X and Y, but you train to make sure you're in the team. And if you're in the team, you're happy and you're earning your bonus or whatever. But the correlation, and there are a series of players like this. I've, I've been told about umpteen players who are like, game day, bang. Mm. How do people do that? I don't know. It's, it's a mentality that you have, um, because I couldn't do that, because I always said that I train the way I play. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I couldn't switch from that. I would always have to chase people down in training. Let's like, say you'd had a bad week in training. Let's say you'd had a Claridge week in training. Would it come into the game? It, well, you'd be worried, it'd, be on it? my, it'd be in my mind. It'll be on my mind. Um, so I'll try and make... I try and do certain things in training, make sure I'm on it. But obviously, not every week you are on, on it in, tra in, in, in training at times. One thing that Martin O'Neill never really did was... Really, he didn't really look at training and say, oh, yeah, he's on it this week, I'm going to play him. Because he knew what characters brought certain stuff to the game and what they were going to do in the game. He always knew that. See, he's really... I, I've met him, spoken to him about this... We've all watched his success. Mm -hmm. He's been a phenomenon. And, and the genealogy, although there's no blood relation, the genealogy is his ideas and his actions are not that different from Clough, mm -hmm. under whom mm -hmm. he played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, do, do us the privilege of trying to explain Martin O'Neill as a manager or, a, or the football manager, because I don't think there's almost anybody left no, like him. No, no, no. Explain for the listener. Martin was a, a man manager. If he liked you and he liked what you did, he'd make you feel like a million million dollars. 
that you could take on the world. If he didn't like you, you probably best to leave the club. He always managed to get the best in that era, always managed to get the best out of play. Just giving you the, the confidence to go out there and perform. Telling you, if he saw something good in you, he would say, I, I, go and do this. Oh, you were absolutely fantastic at that. Oh, look at this. Oh, and next minute you'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to run through a brick wall for this, man. Blah, blah, I'm going to keep doing that. He wouldn't challenge you to do something that you, he knows that you can't do. I remember giving the ball away to, to, to well, not giving, giving it to uh, Robbie Savage. And him giving the ball away. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been a bad pass, I don't know. But he'd given the ball away. And he goes, well, what's he going to do with the ball? Well, what he could do, he could turn out and pass. No, you can get it. You can turn. You can just run. No one's going to catch you. And I'm like, you're right. But <laughs> So he'd give you that confidence to say, okay, yeah, yeah. And that's all, I, that's all he told me to do. You know, get it, turn and run. Shoot. Get it, turn and run, cross. And it was just simplified. Uh, with Gops, for argument's sake. Gops, I need Steve Guppy. Yeah, Steve Guppy. Take people on, cross it. You don't need to really beat them because he was a winger as well. You don't need to beat them. Just get that crossing. Mill, make sure you're on the end of it. So it gives you that confidence. And when you're actually doing it, be praising you, praising you. And, and that just gives you another lift, another boost. And that's all we It's work. a simple Pavlovian thing. You give people praise or reward them or get... To, you get, you it, get, that's what you get back. You're not describing something that's ultimately very complicated. So it functioned, but... We never, we never coached. Never coached. We'd see him on Tuesday, he'd run us, because we had Wednesday off, and then Friday, and then Saturday, obviously, for the game. Friday for the, for the old V Young, and then you'd play, mm-hmm. and you ripped things up. Yeah. <laughs> you, you won League Cups and... Four Wembley appearances in, three, uh, in five years. Was it four? Yeah, four Wembley appearances in five years. What was the most significant, or for you, for you most significant, most enjoyable of those? Because... Apart from possibly having the most League Cups of anybody, you, you, you won or played in finals in Old Wembley, mm-hmm. Cardiff, Hillsborough, if I'm not wrong. Yes. New Wembley? Not new. I played in New Wembley, not, not, but not, 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 for, not final. No, because by the time you were winning with Liverpool, I was, that's why I'm asking, because I can't quite figure. Uh, I went to, with Villa, but was that new or was that, was that new or was that old? That was new, yeah. Let's say, yeah. So new. you've played the final Old Wembley, New Wembley, Cardiff, Hillsborough. That ain't bad. Mm. The one that you maybe take the most satisfaction from, the one that you enjoyed, the strangest, which, which of them to you <sighs> Middlesbrough. stands out? <coughs> Middlesbrough, the first one. Um, That's the Viv's li- middle. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep reminding him about that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he, um, we got we got battered that the, oh, yeah. the week the week or so before we got battered by them I think it was two or three nil or something in the league. league. Um, Janino just absolutely battered us. So again, Martin thought about that, put Pontus Karmark on him to to man mark him. Never did anything, and we we drew that game. But that that was my first cup final. You scored, don't you? Yeah, yeah. That was my first cup final. In the period. Twenty-five yards top corner. No. I, yeah, something like that, tapping. <laughs> Let's just say, yeah. It counted, right? Yeah, it definitely. It went in the net. Yeah, it's got final goal. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that one was one to remember, that one. But it was a draw and then obviously went to... That's when you went to Hillsborough, yeah, I think, isn't Reaper, it? Yeah, and then uh, Stevie Clarice scored. When you got a group of men like that winning a trophy, what is it, a bridge night out or a visit oh, to a museum? or How, Jesus. how, how do you... <laughs> oh. How do you celebrate? I, that? I, you know, I, I never got to the party at the end, so I was. Um, I would have. What would it be? Oh, it's eighteen. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, um, ready to celebrate? It, I would have thought. Yeah, but it was. The thing is, I'm, I'm not a drinker, uh, and decided to have a, a, a pint of beer with everyone in the in the bar because it was me and Stewie Campbell who were the young lads at that time. Pint of beer. Finished that, got on the coach, and mind you, we just finished the game, so no one's uh, no one's eaten or anything like that. You've sweated, you're drained. Then a bottle of champagne. Everyone brings a bottle of champagne. Yeah, you start drinking the bottle of champagne, and I, I, that's all I can remember, to be honest. I can remember coming off the coach. That was it. Hmm. My dad coming to collect me. He did. He did. He did. He, did, he kind of have an inkling that you might you, you might need a bit of shepherding. Yeah. Good man, dad. <laughs> Good man, dad. <laughs> I don't want to skip quickly away from the times that you scored the goals and you won the trophies, but I do think that, or I'd be really interested, that although Liverpool was the one you grew up supporting, mm-hmm. Leicester's in your heart, we've established, mm-hmm. how did you live that Ranieri season? 
and, and as you began to watch, the, did, did, your, uh, did your football eye tell you soon, not that they're going to be champions, but something interesting is happening here? Definitely said uh, something's interesting happening here. Um, what did I think of Ranieri? I didn't really have too much thought because knowing he's a good manager and good tactician, uh, I, I, I didn't know if it was going to work properly. Yeah. I think that's what I'm asking. Yeah, I didn't know if it was going to work properly because at the time, Leicester were just a workhorse team. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a few players. You've got your Mares and play people like that who can give you a little, little bit special every now and again. But it was, it was mainly like what we were. Workhorse team, get, get, get in and amongst them. Get, get Vardy up the top. Get, get the balls behind. Get him on to back of them and score the goals. So I didn't know how it was going to work. And the good thing about what he did was he didn't change the structure too much straight away. And that's, I think, for, that's how I feel a lot of managers, they fail a little bit. You come in here and you want to change this, change that. Yeah, did you like, you're, you're change it too much? Um, players are, 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 are creatures of habit. So try and keep everything structured to a point and just change a little bit every now and again. That's so they don't even notice. But if you come in and say, no, I'm, I'm changing this. Oh, he's got to play now. He's got to do this. And we had it with Bolton. <laughs> Bolton, a load of... Uh, so the youth, the, the youth development officer, uh, the, the head of the, the youth, came and became the manager, and then he started putting all the youth lads in. I get what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. but it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Not straight away. Maybe you put one in at right back. You're not going to put two centre backs and then think that you're going to you're not going to concede goals. You've got to slowly make that. And and I think that's one of the good things that he did. He just didn't implement too much changes straight away, and I think that just spiraled on. I think Pearson's. Uh, if you look up, he, he had a massive thing to do with them winning the league. But no one really wants to say that. But I think that was majority of his team mm -hmm. and the style of play. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, you want a bit of a, uh, evolution and they just weren't able to find it. Did, did you go to any of the games? I went to it. I, I, was actually com I was actually commentating that. At, so, uh, uh, yeah, with, uh, we, I think we did the Newcastle game or something like that. And uh, I went to a couple of the games. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. The thing was, you look, at, you look at that season, and I always said December would be, December, January would be the most important time. And it always is with people's seasons because mm -hmm. it's the time where you get so many games crammed into one. If it comes along, yeah. the pitches are different. You got, you're playing every three days. Yeah. And this this thing about playing every three days, everyone knows that you don't really recover. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why they actually have games every three days. But if you want quality. If you want better football. If you want quality. Let the body and the mind recover. Because it's now scientifically proven that you need X many hours. They, after they did the test. Everyone's yeah. done the test. So they, they give you all that information. Then tell you, yeah, 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 we need you to play every three days. You play, every t uh, you, you play on Saturday and I need you to play on, again on, on, on Monday. But you know I'm not recovered. So it's, it's kind of like, um, let's push into limits and, and see who'll come through. Let's admit that there'll be injuries and errors and rather than have... Well, that's why they have bigger squads now as well. Mm -hmm. so, but the smaller clubs don't have that, 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 that uh, privilege of having bigger squads where you can actually say, OK, well, you 11 are going to play. And then we'll say, OK, um, how do you feel? OK, you sit out there and then I'll put him in there. Which is why you knew that that's the, that was the first big hurdle that Leicester side had to come through. Yeah. That, that a Christmas, January period. And everyone else faltered and they, kept, they were the strongest. Mm -hmm. The good thing is you had uh, Chelsea really bad that season. Uh, the, only, the only real challenge was Spurs. Mm -hmm. Everyone else had kind of, I don't, I don't know what happened. And possibly they were also proof of your theory that they physically floundered in that last they four, were, six they, weeks. They were doing what they generally do. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, they, they, they nearly there, but they, it's just that, that last little hurdle you've got to get over. Whether it's talent or whatever, they, it becomes Sometimes part of your it's, mentality. It's a, it's, a long, it, it's a long season. You know, they, 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 they play so many games. I remember the season I played uh, with, with Liverpool, I think it was 60-something games we played. I think mm. I played 61 or 59 mm. games in mm. one season. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think we played Saturday, something like Saturday, Tuesday, Friday, Sunday, or Thursday. Stuff. It was like four or five games in one week. Well, you were asked to change a little bit because you mentioned Vardy, and I'm really interested from a personal point of view, mm -hmm. that's speculation now. You know, he, he quite likes, he likes very much the ball over the top mm -hmm. into a channel. If his Leicester could catch the other team, giving the ball away in a certain position, you send oh, him away. Yeah. 
he's at his happiest. He's most likely to score not simply because he's breaking and the number of people he's against has gone down. Mentally, that's when he's at his mm-hmm. happiest. He's now going to play in a Brendan Rodgers team, which is play a different brand of football, where he's going to be supplied from higher up the pitch. Let's say whether it's Madison, whoever, but positionally they're going to be different. They're probably going to play less on the break. They want to dominate the ball. He's going to be increasingly asked, mm. has been since February when Rodgers took over, to play differently. Mm. You you had to adapt, didn't you? From what had made you successful at Leicester, you had to show, I don't know, at Liverpool, you had to, <laughs> positionally well, we were, it was different, we, you were given the had, ball differently. Well, we had, we went from, uh, no disrespect to Leicester, we went from a more of a counter-attacking team, um, holding the ball up and chasing the channels and uh, to actually having more of the ball. We uh, we probably had 30, 30% of the ball at Leicester to 60% of the ball at Liverpool. How do you break someone down? We went from we went from having two banks of four yeah. at Leicester and then and then us two working up there. Us two sit, being you and uh, whoever, or you and Clarage whoever, or whoever it is and sitting back and, and soaking up pressure and hitting on the break. Um, and then uh, two, basically the other way around, where people are sitting in front of you and you've got to try and create space, you've got to have plenty of movement. Were you mentally prepared for that before you moved? Were you like, I know this is going to be completely well, I, different? I, I, I was lucky I played with the national team. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> different, ta- different style of football. And then I was, my football brain was... Engaged, it was good. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I, I could l- pick up on certain things fairly quickly and I could learn it and I did that quite quickly. Um, and I adapted fairly quickly for that for that change that we had. And so there was an emotional thing about going to Liverpool. Listen, it's a bigger club. You mm. probably felt you had m- even more chance of winning trophies, which proved to be yeah, true. Yeah, of course. Uh, the John Barnes thing. Mm-hmm. I, I, in your youth, Liverpool had been uh, you know, a club that you'd supported. It. You, you probably look at it as being a brilliant move for you in terms mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. just about everything. Is that correct? Yeah. It was the right move. I, I um, had options. Villa, Doug Ellis was... Onto me through uh, Peter Taylor okay. um, to to come and even just have a discussion. But once I knew Liverpool were involved, it was a case of, well, what's the point in speaking to anyone else? It was just, yeah. I think Spurs were interested, but I don't know if there was any real interest. I think they were just sniffing around. And one of the characters that has, again, featured in our series that I like very much indeed, I want to pick on, is the arrival of Gary McAllister. <laughs> Is, is a big positive for you Huge. in every way. We, Carragher was in this as well, and he went that about six weeks before they signed um, Gary, Julio was briefing the team, saying, I think he must have been playing Coventry, maybe. Mm-hmm. McAllister's finished, slowest playing team, get on him. But, <laughs> and six weeks later, he's like, why would you say Gary McAllister? <laughs> but I, I think you can understand. I don't understand why this. That's just a mental thing for us. Kind Ex- of, yeah. Explain, Gary. Gary was just a, a, a great individual to be around. Um, you say that his legs had gone, it hadn't. They hadn't. Maybe, uh, maybe sharpness to get there for 10 yards, but he, he, up and down, you could. You, you, he was big, as good as anyone else. And his football brain was amazing. And so having him around as a senior figure, because you've got to remember, I went from being at Leicester mm-hmm. with all senior figures. So they would look after you, tell you, oh, yeah, well done, blah, blah, this and that, take you under your wing, as in on the football pitch. So... Going from there and then going to Liverpool where you hadn't... Uh, we've got Sammy Appiah and players like that, but we haven't really got a senior, senior figure. We had a lot of younger lads. So um, going to there and having him there was amazing. You know, he was just great. Just uh, uh, wonderful. People underestimate what a fantastic passer of the ball oh, he was. Yeah. In the Even Heskey scored book, you talk about service from Beckham and yeah. service from Guppy, mm-hmm. service from Scholes. But Gary's in that, at oh, least yeah. in that class. There's, there's a lot of them are in that class as well, but not, not a lot of people don't talk about. There's so many players. I, I, you remember I played with Gary Parker. Yeah. <laughs> I know the regard you've got. <laughs> I've watched him play also on, at Villa. Yeah. That right? I wasn't at Villa with him. No, he, but... He played at Villa, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. could see his class. And I think Martin kept Gary as part of his coaching team. But if you if you want to explain to people who because not everybody was of the age to have seen no, Gary. No, no, no. Gary McAllister was and yeah. or, 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 or Parks too. Yeah. You, you you said there's a lot of them. Yeah. And you made a big statement about Gary Parker that he's in that company yeah, that yeah, I was yeah. mentioning. Yeah, he is 100 percent he is. And uh, you, you look at Maka. Um, these are players, and it's funny because I even spoke about it later on in in the book when I moved from Liverpool to to Birmingham. That was a tough transition because I'm so used to them players. 
Then you go to uh, a different caliber of players, still a professional player, still a good player, but they don't see a pass. They don't see that pass. They, don't, they can't make that pass. Is that brutally frustrating? Very, but you adapt very quickly. I'm, I, like I said, I, I can adapt. So I had to adapt very quickly. I'm used to getting a little eye contact with uh, Stevie G and spinning and going and him going, playing it. Skulls. Um, Danny Murphy. Players like that, you know, the, the ability to actually find a pass, find a pass. Then, then having no disrespect to them at Birmingham, but then having them just going side to side, keeping it simple, going backwards, and then it going longer, mm-hmm. and then playing from there. Would you have intervened at that stage and said to some of the Birmingham players, like, do, do this, think about this? Can they, can they do it? <laughs> That's the thing. So I just left them to do and let me adapt around it. Um, because uh, if you get to 26, 27, 28, and you're not doing it then... It isn't there. No. You explain in the book mm-hmm. that you're, you, when you began to experience coming back to Liverpool, that you were a little bit overcome by... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flipping yeah. it, they actually appreciate yeah. and love me there. It's, the thing is, when you're in an environment, and per se, and you, you, you don't really know what you got there... Your only you, the thing is, I would say, is keep away from newspapers because mm-hmm. they will give you a false Sorry about that. image on yeah. on certain things. Get to know your fans because I, I, it's now I get to understand how much they love me. But it, it, it didn't. It you weren't did, aware. I wasn't aware. I did feel like that, but I wasn't fully aware or fully a grasp of how much. It's a great adulation, and it, it can be dangerous for people's egos. But it's a fabulous feeling. I, I imagine it's a great feeling to be appreciated by a bank of men and yeah. women who are singing about you. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, and even now, I walk, even now when I go around Liverpool and that, oh, yeah, great, thank you for what you did. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fine. But the, you, 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 I didn't realise how much it was appreciated me, what I did. It's nice to get in people's hearts. Oh, yeah. It's still in the book, and, and maybe you can explain it before we finish on something about the title. Mm-hmm. In essence, I didn't want to leave Liverpool, but I needed to leave them. If I'd stayed, I don't know if I'd been the same person. Mm-hmm. I was scrutinised for the clothes I wear, what I did, how my hair and stubble was, whether I had an earring or not, Pff, on yeah. it goes. You, you actually say um, that if you'd stayed at Liverpool, life would have been drained from me from the pressure. My mood would have been different. Mm-hmm. It affected my lifestyle my health, everything. The way I can begin to think about understanding that is I, I, I'm lucky to live through a really successful year at Barcelona, I'm the city I live in. I watched Xavi and, and Puyol and whoever, Iniesta, Casillas around it. And when I meet them to interview them now, one of them's tucked away in Oporto, one of them's in Qatar. Carlos Puyol has been out and basically doesn't answer his phone, Valdez disappeared, and they all say, we desperately needed the pressure to go away. We, we took it and won and coped with it until we were 35, 36. And now, it'll take about two, three, four years to depressurize. Is that akin to what you're talking about, the needing to get out of that magnifying glass at Anfield? I think, yeah, I think when I went to Liverpool, I, I think I was sponsored by someone, I can't remember. I, I think it might have been Nike. Uh, excuse me if it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Apologise. It's done. Anyway, Fine. I was I was sponsored by someone, and I and uh, you got to remember, I was 22. I had not long, I'd not left Leicester. Leicester is where I'm from. Grow up. That's where all my people are. Everything. I come up to this place. I know nothing about moving clubs. No one had told me that when you go to when you actually go and you're presented as a new player, you should wear a suit and a tie and this. And that. I think I can help you here. Did you turn up in Puma? Oh, you? there you go. There you go. Teamwork, you see? There you go. So, oh, sorry, Puma. No. <laughs> We've done it well. They get an extra mention. There you now. go. So I've turned up with that. I'm sponsored by them. So I've turned up in that, and it was a big hoo-ha about where, why is he not wearing a suit? Why is he? Uh, okay, deal. fair enough. Well, Good deal. What? Oh, look at his earring. Why is he? <laughs> but so it, then that just goes on. If you're not doing so well, it just amplifies. So at the time, I still had a year left at Liverpool, and I wasn't ready to leave, really. Came to me, I think it was Rick Parry came to me and said, uh, they brought Cissé, uh, they've accepted a deal from um, Birmingham, go and talk to them. I said, like, I really want to go. Mm. I, 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 prof- I was speaking to my agent, and that, I don't really want to go, I'd fight for my place. But they, they said, no, no, they're gonna, he's going to play, you're not going to play. OK, that's fine, I'll go and have a look at what Birmingham's like. Went met with Steve Bruce, um, it was back in the Midlands, um, so I took it up, but it was a good thing because it allowed me to just come out of that cauldron, that pressure cooker, into 
So I think I was a little bit less. Uh, the, it was still pressure because it's football. You want to yeah. win games, but it's nowhere near what that is. That is tough. You've got to be. You've got to be mentally, physically, and mentally uh, uh, ready for that because it will drain you. Then we we must. You've explained that well. We must let you go, but we must finish on the reason for the title of the book because. Anybody who watched England going to Germany, England is such a psychosis about Germany. <laughs> Whatever Lineker's expression about 90 minutes, 11 men, then Germany win, blah, blah, blah. When Old Wembley was closed by Didi Amman scoring that. And that was the pressure we're going into the game with. Then you end up 1-0 down. Should have been 2-0 down. That is tough. But none of you looked as if you were thinking, oh, well, here we go again. <laughs> no, no, no. And that... And it, even as a Scot, that was a beautiful football performance. Yeah, we, we had some good players. We, 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 at times, we gelled so well. And it just looked, everything just clicked and everyone knew. It's brilliant, your eyes are shining now looking yeah. back at it. You're mentally in that, nah, back you, in the you, Olympic you, Stadium. You, you know everything just gels, everything just clicks. When you've got, you, you, you look, at this, look at our defensive pair of uh, Rio and so. Can you name me two better? They're, it's elite, isn't it? Yeah. Complementary, smart, athletic. Footballing, so, uh, we've been taught over this series. Don't know Saul. Don't know people talking about more. People, uh, particularly Manchester United colleagues, have said you need to understand differently about Rio's competitiveness, about his leadership qualities. <laughs> you know, uh, Vida got the, the armband, I think, at, at United, and everybody who's talked to us in this series about that said probably should have been Rio. So leader, elegant, <laughs> tall, athletic. Yeah. It's a brilliant pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A brilliant pick. Well, and in front of them. Uh, we had uh, Skulls, I think it was Skulls and Stevie G, Bex Stevie. and Nicky Barnby. Sorry. We had the best left back in of an era, uh, Ashley Cox. Ashley was different, it probably still is different class, but phenomenal footballer, phenomenal yeah. athlete. And then myself and Michael up front. Which was a proper partnership. Do, do you remember the build up? Do you remember thinking, we'll win here? Do you remember. When it's nearly <coughs> nil, maybe speaking personally or what no, leaders you know, in the team I, say. I always, I always went into games just, it's another game, can they stop me? Nice, <laughs> nice. I always went into games like that. I, <laughs> and, and, and I think that went off uh, a bit off Martin O'Neill because we never really focused. It wasn't until I went to Liverpool that we really focused on opposition. England as well, obviously. But when I was at Leicester, we never really focused on opposition as such. It was only that time when we went to the to the League Cup final when we got battered before. You thought, okay, let me put him on. Close down Janinho. And then everyone else can do what they're doing. Um, but So I never really focused on that sort of stuff. And um, But it was a bit, obviously, there's a big hoo-ha when it comes to playing Germany all the time. We lost the last game at the, at the old uh, Wembley, which is a massive, huge thing. Then you go into their backyard and you're, you're one nil down. But we, we we had the characters, we had the we had the leaders, and everyone led by example as well. We didn't just have one, uh, whoever. Uh, obviously, Bex was the captain, but we didn't, it wasn't just Bex who, who was leading. We had we had eleven on there, eleven leaders on that pitch, and that was the good thing about about England at that time. Especially like now, you're you're always waiting for someone else to do something. When I when I watch England, I'm always waiting for someone else to do something. I'm always looking. Oh, why didn't he go? Take that by by by, uh, by his, the ball by his horns. Oh, he's waiting for him to do something. And then he's waiting for him to do something. It, someone's got to do something. And in that team, we always had someone to do. Even you know, like you're saying, Ashley. I always say Ashley Cole is the best best left back of that era. And listen, we maybe we need a second interview. But again, this bugs me the way that he was written about. That he mm-hmm, was treated, mm-hmm. and it's been transferred to Raheem now. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's reached a stage where you know it's intolerable. It's not even down to what people wear. Huh. What's it got to do with anyone? <laughs> what you're wearing now, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I know that rubbish. I know all that rubbish. You can, listen, <laughs> you're allowed to say it, mate. It's, it's okay. It doesn't bother me. It's your... <laughs> so I can't do it. If I want to dress like this, it's okay. I know, I know. I, I have no explanation, about, unless we come back to the theme that we began upon, that yeah, inherently yeah. it's about, well, let's just pick on the guy who's different from us. Different. And I think, that, I, think like. that, I think that's the... the, the, the yeah. You feel that similar about how Ashley was treated? I think so, yeah. Um, I just think uh, you look at... This is another episode, really, but if you look at the trophies he's won, but he's never been given the accolades that others who who have uh, who have probably not as been, won as much as him. I tell you, I... And I, they're, saying it's, they're saying it's for achievements within sports. 
Uh-huh. He's, won them, he's won more than anyone else. Well, I, I remember meeting him down at Chelsea's training ground and interviewing him one day. And it was in one of those sort of inflatable training ground things yeah, where yeah, you... Yeah, yeah. But when it rains, it, it drums and yeah, you can't yeah. interview. So you, we, we sat there, thank the Lord, talking on our own. Mm-hmm. Him and Torres for about half an hour because we can't do the TV interview. Brilliant, yeah. Because one of the things, the few things we've got to complain about is like, we need to meet you guys so that the first time that we talk isn't doing this or mm-hmm. after a game or looking for a headline. We, oh, this has been nice. I, I like you. Or, or, okay, you're not too bad. And Ashley was eloquent, articulate, interesting, funny. It was just a joy. And I'm like, well, you're nothing like you're portrayed. Nothing. And then you look at his football achievements and the way that he changed Chelsea, kept himself in shape. And did, all that happened was one person once said, He's greedy, and therefore it just mushrooms what is, like what, that, what out is, of order. What, what is greed, though? It, it, was, it was an unjustifiable criticism. <laughs> it, it Maybe the, the incident about swerving we'll, off the thing, it we all, maybe maladroitly we all have, written. We all have, uh, we're all in a job. Now, if, if someone else dangles a carrot of a bigger job, who's gonna, what, what are we well, all going to do? What would each of us do? <laughs> and largely, we would do what each footballer each, each age does. We're employees, that's what they are, so they're going to go to things. I hope that people are convinced that they should go out and find and buy even Heskey scored. <laughs> I'm also pretty convinced that it should have said, Emil Heskey, just give me the ball. Yeah, that or, might be the back page. Emil Heskey, <laughs> can you cope with me? <laughs> You've coped with us brilliantly. Thank You've you been generous much. with your time. It's been a joy. Thank no, you very thank much you. indeed. Thank you. Thanks for having Emil me. Emil Legend. Thank you.